Hello friends, uh, in this very small lecture, I would be discussing with you the derivation of Fresnel diffraction integral. So I would discuss with you the Fresnel diffraction integral. And then um, during the discussion, the discussion of the derivation of that integral, I would also be discussing with you the Fresnel approximation. And also, I would very briefly discuss with you the Fraunhofer approximation. Okay. So now, first of all, let us consider a plane with the coordinate system, the axis zeta and eta. We call this plane as zeta eta plane and on this plane you have a slit, you have an aperture of arbitrary size, arbitrary shape. I'm not saying that it's a slit, I'm not saying that it's a circular aperture. It is having a very general shape. So what does, so what is the meaning of aperture? The aperture means that the transmission function or the transmittance of that aperture is one inside this area and the transmittance is zero outside that means that if you shine this aperture with light for example a plane wave okay so let us consider the incidence of a plane wave then this plane wave will transmit will get transmitted through inside of that aperture and will be blocked from this area and let us consider because we are going to study the diffraction that how this aperture will diffract this plane wave so at certain at a certain distance z from the input aperture the zeta and eta plane which is having a coordinate system x and y you just consider another plane well this plane will be the screen for example the diffraction uh, will be observed on the screen so you let us suppose that the distance between the aperture and the screen is z so that means the origin of coordinate system is here it is zeta eta plane the z is zero here and at a distance of z you are placing screen we'll call this as an xy um, xy plane where you are going to observe diffraction now let us consider that you have an observation point P here. You want to calculate the field at point P because of the diffraction done by this aperture. So the coordinate of this point P will be X, Y and Z and you are going to observe diffraction here. So now what is the concept? Here we are going to use the Huygens uh, principle of diffraction, the Huygens principle of the Huygens wave concept. So what we assume that this aperture it is made up of so many point sources. So what happens that when this input plane wave uh, is incident on that plane, all the point sources will be emitting um, the spherical waves and these spherical waves the resultant of all these spherical waves will be seen at point p and important thing to note is that the the spherical wave which is emitted by all these points will be at different phase at point p so you're going to find the resultant of all those um, spherical waves which are emitted by these point sources and uh, the resultant diffraction the result the, the resultant field at point p will be due to all these point sources okay so now this is the aperture function the transmittance function of this aperture you let us suppose that it is u zeta eta so what is u zeta eta the u zeta eta means that the transmission the u zeta eta is one inside the aperture and u zeta eta is zero outside now we are assuming so many point sources so as we know that uh, uh, the equation of 
A spherical wave is given by e raised to power j k r divided by r. Where what is r? R is the distance between uh, the point source and uh, the distance between point source and the point of observation. And this u zeta eta will be limiting these point sources. So when you multiply these things, what you are going to do? You are going to say that okay, these point sources are only inside this aperture. There is nothing outside. Okay, so you are going to multiply. And to calculate or to take into account the effect of all those point sources, what you will be doing? You will integrate this function over zeta and eta plane. Okay, so this integration will go from minus infinity to plus infinity, and if u x y is um, the field at x y plane, so this u x y the field the, uh, on the screen will be proportional to this integral. Okay, so now you replace this proportionality constant and the proportionality with a constant. So this u x y will be given by c times integration u zeta eta e raised to power j k r divided by r this is the uh, spherical wave and you integrate over all zetas and etas so this is the diffraction integral the initial form of diffraction integral now what we want now we want to calculate the value of this constant c here so how we'll do that okay you let us suppose that you are going you are in uh, you are going to shine this aperture with a plane wave and if you suppose that there was no aperture here so that simply means that this plane wave will be traveling without any change so that means that this plane wave will be a plane wave at this plane and will be a plane wave at this plane so how you will write this fact in terms of equations so this can be written as Okay, one important thing to note is that you don't need to write this integral from minus infinity to plus infinity because this uh, u zeta eta will take care of that because its value will be always outside the aperture, outside the slit and uh, its value will be only uh, unity inside. So you don't need to write uh, minus infinity to plus infinity because this will take care of that. Okay, so now let me write you just assume that the value of this uh, the transmission is one everywhere which simply means that there is no slit there is no aperture so you make it one and the value of this integral will be simply the plane wave this that is the distance between uh, the aperture and the screen so this is the normalization con condition and we will be calculating the value of constant from here. So how we will do that? This r can be calculated from here because uh, this is x, y, z and you have a point source let us say here and its coordinates will be zeta, eta and zero. So the distance between this point and point P will be given by Okay, so let me write r will be given by square root of x minus zeta whole square plus y minus eta whole square plus z square. So I am simply applying the distance formula x minus zeta whole square plus y minus eta whole square plus z minus zero whole square. Okay. So now what you can do is you can take z common from here. Okay, so what you can write, you if you take z outside, this z square will become z, and uh, you can write one plus x minus zeta upon z whole square plus y minus eta upon z whole square is to the power one by two. Now here you make a very small approximation. What I am going to write is that the value of x minus zeta mod that is very small as compared to z and 
the value of y minus eta mod its value is also very small as compared to z so what is the physical meaning of that as you know that this zeta eta plane this is your initial plane the plane where your initial aperture is and this xy plane that is your screen so x minus zeta what does it mean the maximum value of zeta and eta that will be decided by the size of this aperture and the maximum value of this x and y will be decided by the, si the size of the screen so x minus zeta it will be very small if your size of aperture is very small as compared to the distance z and similarly the value of y minus eta that will also be very small as compared to the distance z only when this size of aperture is very small well the small small is with respect to the distance z here okay so if you have this approximation so what you can do is you can apply binomial approximation here so what is binomial approx approx approximation let me write binomial approximation is sometimes binomial expansion it is 1 plus x raised to the power n that is given by 1 plus nx plus n n minus 1 x square upon 2 factorial plus so on this will be valid only when x is very very small smaller than 1 and because x minus zeta is very small compared to z to this factor as a whole will be very small as compared to 1 so you can uh, very easily very safely uh, do the binomial expansion of this relation okay so what you do let me write this will be uh, if you compare these two relations then this as a whole this will be your x and the n value of n will be half so what i'm going to do i'm going to take only two terms because i'm again saying that if x minus zeta is very small as compared to z then x minus zeta whole square which is here that will be very very small as compared to z so you can safely neglect the third term so we are going to take only two terms so that means that the expansion will be given by one plus half of this plus half of this it's one plus nx okay so let me write that will be given by z one plus half of x minus zeta upon z whole square plus half of y minus eta upon z whole square this is after the first approximation that x minus zeta and y minus zeta mod is very small as compared to z so simply this can be written as z plus 1.2 z x minus zeta whole square plus 1.2 z y minus eta whole square so now this factor e raised to power uh, e raised to power j k r that can be written as okay so let me write because this is r so e raised to power uh, j k r this is very simple mathematics that can be approximately written as e raised to power j k z and e raised to power j k divided by 2 z x minus zeta whole square plus y minus eta whole square so therefore the expression for the spherical wave that can be written as e raised to power j k r divided by r that will be given by e raised to power j k z divided by r and e raised to power j k divided by 2 z x minus zeta whole square plus y minus eta whole square okay so here i'm going to make a very small approximation if your distance z is sufficiently large so the angle made by the observation point with the origin that will be very small so that simply means that this r the distance r that can be very safely replaced uh, with the distance z so this r can be approximately written as z but 
um, while doing this approximation you have to you have to be very careful because I can very safely replace this R by Z but I cannot apply the same approximation in the exponential term because this term is also coming from R after binomial approximation so you cannot replace the exponential part with Z so what is the reason because that portion is mul being multiplied by the k which is a wave vector and as we know that the value of k is written by 2 pi by lambda and for the visible region this lambda is approximately uh, typically it goes from uh, let us say 400 nanometers to let us say 750 nanometers typical numbers so this lambda is of the order of 10 raised to power minus 7 so now that means that k is very large k becomes very large so because this k is being multiplied by this uh, r k r so you cannot do that approximation in the exponential part so you have to be very careful so this r can be very safely replaced by z but nothing is to be nothing should be done here because this k is a very large function this k the value of k is very large okay so let me write it is e raised to power j k z divided by z i am replacing this r by z here and the rest is same let me write e raised to power j k upon 2 z x minus zeta whole square plus y minus eta whole square okay so now let me write the normalization equation which is this one again so what we have we have c times integral over whole space from minus infinity to plus infinity the value of the uh, we are considering that there is no aperture so value of u zeta eta will be 1 here it will be simply e raised to power j k r divided by r d zeta d eta that will be e raised to power j k z that simply means that the incident plane wave let me repeat the incident plane wave remains plane wave because there is nothing here so what you do now we just write the e raised to power j k r i mean this term here okay so what you can write e raised to power j k z divided by z because integral is over zeta and eta so this z is constant it can be taken outside the integral so what you can write is simply minus infinity to plus infinity e raised to power j k upon 2 z x minus zeta whole square which is this term and e raised to power j k upon 2 z y minus eta whole square d zeta d eta and that will be equal to e raised to power j k z which is a plane wave now here you can see this is an independent term there is an independent term this one so you can separately calculate the integral over zeta and then integral over eta and you just multiply so now first you consider this integral so i will be given by minus infinity to plus infinity e raised to power j k upon 2 z x minus zeta whole square d zeta okay so here you have to remember you should know a very standard integral okay so let me write this minus infinity to plus infinity e raised to power minus alpha x square plus beta x that is given by pi upon alpha square root e raised to power beta square upon 4 alpha well this is very often used in quantum mechanics if you are doing quantum mechanics this equation will you must be familiar with this equation okay so this is the square term which is here but here it is x minus zeta so you have to do the substitution so what substitution do you substitute x minus zeta with some variable let us say gamma so this d zeta that will be given by minus of d gamma because there is minus here so that means that integral i becomes minus infinity to plus infinity with the minus sign because minus is here e raised to power j k upon 2 z gamma square d gamma 
So if we compare this equation with this equation, the value of alpha comes out to be jk upon 2z. And of course, beta is 0. So that means the value of this integral will be, okay, so let me write minus 1, which is this minus pi upon alpha. So this will be pi divided by alpha jk upon 2z square root of this. And this will be given by this will be given by minus 2 pi z divided by k square root 1 upon j oh, uh, okay I think it should be minus j because let, let me check uh, this is alpha okay oh I'm sorry because this was minus alpha square and there is plus so this alpha will be minus of this this is minus I'm sorry because this is minus alpha x square and this is some positive alpha x square here positive alpha x square so this alpha will be minus jk upon 2z okay so that means that there will be minus sign here so there will be a minus sign here okay so this is the value of integral i and similarly the value of integral i prime which is minus infinity to plus infinity the second integral this one this is e raised to power jk upon 2z y minus eta whole square d eta that will be also same because the function form is same you are integrating over eta so the value will be same it will be minus 2 pi z divided by k the k is the uh, 2 pi by lambda and 1 upon minus j which where minus j is the complex j is equal to minus 1 square root okay so what you do now you substitute these values i and i prime where this is i this is i prime you substitute it here so what you will get let me write okay, let me take a new page what you will get is uh, you will get c times okay let me show you this equation again uh, this one c times e raised to power jk upon z so this will be there so it is c times e raised to power jk z upon z and then you have the, the first integral and the second integral you multiply these values and you just equate with e raised to power jkz okay so uh, the first integral was minus 2 pi z divided by k and 1 upon minus j square root and the value of second integral was same so you just put a square and that will be equal to the plane wave jkz okay so this can be written as c times uh, c will be given by because uh, as you can see this will be square so this square root will be removed this square root will be removed this minus will be cancelled by this minus this z will be cancelled by this z this e raised to power jkz will be cancelled by this e raised to power jkz so you will be simply left with minus j upon lambda or you can also write 1 upon j lambda so this is the value of constant which we have calculated so that means that final form of uh, the diffraction integral that will be given by u of x y that is given by 1 upon j lambda which is this term integral over minus infinity to plus infinity in fact you don't need to write this minus infinity to plus infinity because u zeta eta will take care of that and e raised to power j k r divided by r d zeta d eta Now let me discuss one very important point with you because when you do the uh, the binomial approximation you had written r is equal to x uh, z plus x minus zeta whole square by 2z plus y minus eta whole square by 2z. 
So initially, before doing any binomial approximation, this expression of r square was x square plus y square plus z square. And as you know that this is equation of a sphere in three dimensions, which simply means that any point source that will be giving you that will be giving you uh, spherical wave fronts. And as you can see, that by dropping the higher order terms in the binomial appro approximation, you get this term. And what is this? This is equation of a paraboloid, or in one dimension you can say it is a parabola. So you are simply replacing the spherical wave fronts with the parabolic, the paraboloid uh, in three dimensions. If you rotate a parabola around the z-axis, around the axis of symmetry, you will get a paraboloid in three dimensions. You are replacing the spherical wave fronts with the paraboloid. Okay, so let me pictorially depict this fact. You had some aperture, and you have screen at some distance z. So each and every point source was giving you spherical waves. So these spherical waves will be going. These are what I'm. What am I drawing? These are the wave fronts. The wave fronts for a point source are in the form of spheres. And at the screen, for a given z, you are replacing this sphere. This sphere, because this will be a sphere. This wave front will be of the form of sphere. You are replacing this sphere. Uh, with a parabola, something like that. This will be a parabola. We replaced a spherical wave with a parabola. So let me. So what happens that? Okay. So let me draw for you. If you have a circle, and on the same circle, if you draw a parabola, as you can see that within this range, I mean, within this from my, this point to this point. This parabola will be exactly coinciding with the sphere, with the circle in this case. So that means that the, this approximation will be holding very good if you are in this region. And similar argument can be applied to this case that if your distance z is quite large, if the aperture size is quite small as compared to z, so that means that for a given distance, you can very safely replace the spherical wave fronts with the parabolic wave fronts so you are not going to get any let's say very large errors so this approximation is there so this this approximation sometimes is also written as parabolic approximation parabolic because you are simply replacing spherical wave fronts with uh, parabolic approximation i'm sorry this is parabolic approximation okay so this is the thing i wanted to discuss okay so let me write down the reflection integral for you once again because i want to write this integral in a very beautiful form okay so let me write down again this was 1 upon uh, j lambda double integral zeta eta e raised to power j k z divided by r and d zeta d eta this was the initial form and after substituting the value of z here uh, what you had uh, okay so let me write down 1 upon j lambda u of zeta eta j k z divided by z after substituting the value of okay i'm sorry this is r after substituting the value of r you will get this thing e raised to power jk upon 2z x minus zeta whole square plus y minus eta whole square d zeta d eta okay so as you know that this integral is over zeta and eta and this z can be taken as constant you can take this term outside the integral okay so what you can write is e raised to power j k z divided by j lambda z u of zeta eta e raised to power j k upon 2 z x minus zeta whole square plus y minus eta whole square d zeta d eta so this is another form of diffraction integral so 
if you are familiar with the concept of convolution you can very easily interpret that interpret this equation in, in terms of a convolution operation so what is this this integral is nothing but the convolution of the transmittance function aperture with a quadratic phase function okay so let me tell you what is convolution okay let me tell you if we have two functions fx and gx and you want to calculate the convolution of these two functions so this convolution is defined as you integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity f of x prime g of x minus x prime dx prime so this is the convolution integral this is convolution integral okay so how you interpret this you have any function uh, one function fx and gx and this is the integral so as you can see that there is minus of x prime and this is x prime so what you are doing here you are flipping g you are flipping that means you are changing plus x is plus x to minus x so you are flipping this z and this x plus x will be giving you a shift in the x direction depending on plus or minus this shift will be along plus axis or minus axis and you have you have the product of two functions and you are doing the integration so th this is nothing but um, the area of overlap between the function f and g for different values of shift so this will the cx will give you the area of overlap as a function of x where x is the shift okay so as you shift the function the the area of overlap will be changing for some values of x the area of overlap will be zero for some value of uh, x towards other direction the way the area of overlap will be zero so this will give you an area of overlap as a function of shift okay so as you can see that this diffraction integral is also of the form of convolution okay so let me first give you an example of convolution okay very simple example uh as we know that a rect function is defined as uh just one minute a rect function is defined as rect of okay let me focus it why this is happening uh yes a rect function is defined as rect of x upon a that is defined as 1 when mod of x is less than a by 2 that means x is less than a by 2 and greater than minus a by 2 and zero otherwise okay so how this function will look let me show you if this is your x axis this is rect so this will be like that its value will be 1 here and it will be from plus a by 2 to minus a by 2 this is zero okay so this is the first function and because this is a symmetric function that means that if you change plus x from minus x because here you have to shift uh, i'm going to calculate the convolution of rect function with rect function itself so that means f is a rect i'm assuming g is also i'm i'm also taking rect so if you shift g that means if you change from plus x to minus x because this is a symmetric function this will remain same so the second function will be same there will be no change for the asymmetric functions there will be change but for the symmetric functions there will be no change so this is x axis and this is rect okay yes okay so i want to calculate the convolution of these two functions okay now okay so what is the area of this curve this is 1 this is a so this area is a so now if you don't do any shift that means that first rect will be overlapping with the second rect so the area of overlap will be a because this rect will come exactly over this rect so this rect will be along this one so area of overlap will be a this will not be 2a please be careful this will be a so the area of overlap will be a so when you start shifting this rect towards right side 
the area of overlap will start decreasing okay so let me draw if you have first rect and you start shifting second rect so area of overlap will be changing it will be decreasing and it will be zero when the shift along x axis will be a because you are going from this point to this point so what will be the situation in this case this will be first rect and this will be the second rect here so the shift from point, this point to this point will be a so the final convolution will be look like that will be looking like that for no shift th this is the shift and this will be the area of overlap for no shift the area of overlap was a and as you start shifting your rectangular function towards positive x direction the area of overlap starts decreasing and the area of overlap will become zero when this shift is by uh, minus uh, plus a towards this direction so this will be plus a and similarly similar argument will be holding good towards the negative x direction so its area of overlap will be zero when the value of shift will be minus a okay so this will be uh, the convolution of these two rect functions okay uh, just just one minute okay and if you see carefully this integral is also of the form of convolution because this is nothing but the convolution of u zeta eta with a quadratic phase function e raised to power j k upon 2 z zeta square plus eta square or if you call this as u of x y this is the convolution of this with e raised to power j k upon 2 z x square plus y square so what you can write is let me write the convolution form of okay so this is the convolution form convolution form will be the final diffraction pattern on the screen that will be nothing but the convolution of h x y this is the sign of convolution with u1 x y where u1 x y is the transmittance function of your aperture where what is h h is given by e raised to power jk upon 2z x square plus y square where this function is sometimes also written as Fresnel's Fresnel impulse response function okay so let me show you again this this is e raised to power jk upon this minus zeta is giving you the shift and you are integrating double integral because this area will be area of overlap will be in two dimensions zeta and eta okay so this is a very good form this is the convolution form so what does it mean it simply means that if you have u1 xy the, the aperture function what you do you just do the convolution of h x y with the u1 x y and you will definitely get the output uh, diffraction of course there is some constant factor sitting here because i'm not writing this this factor this factor is there just one minute uh, just one minute pardon okay so the final diffraction will be nothing but the convolution of hxy with the input aperture function the initial aperture function where hxy is given by this function this is known as the Fresnel impulse response function okay so now the computationally it is quite difficult to do this convolution function convolution operation because you have to do multiple shifts and at the same time you have to calculate um, the area of overlap between two functions so it's quite tedious job so what you can do you can explore the Fourier transform property the property of Fourier transform of the convolution of two functions so let me write if you do the Fourier transform of two functions G and F so that is nothing but the Fourier transform of g multiplied by simple multiplication 
So this is the what does it say? It says that the Fourier transform of convolution of two functions is nothing but the product of Fourier transform of two individual functions. So this property, using this property, you can easily calculate the diffraction integral. So what you have to do is, we just need to calculate uh, the Fourier transform of uh, hxy, and you have to calculate the Fourier transform of uxy, u zeta eta, let us say. And you just simple, you do just simple, do this. Uh, you just do simple multiplication, and you will get the final field uh, on the screen. Okay. Okay. So now, uh, during derivation of uh, these diffraction integrals, we have made a very important approximation, which is let me write down once again: x minus zeta is very less as compared to z, and y minus eta is very less as compared to z. And during the binomial approximation, we had taken only two terms, and we had neglected the third term or third term of this approximation, uh, this expansion. Uh, this is n. Okay, so if you calculate the third term, because these two terms we have incorporated in our diffraction integrals. Okay, so let me write down the third term. The third term will be given by because this this was z1 plus x minus because before doing binomial approximation we have this okay if we calculate the third term the third term will be given by it will be simply z this is n n minus 1 x square by 2 so it will be n n minus 1 this half because this is 2 factorial and x square which is x minus zeta upon z whole square plus y minus eta upon z whole square this is the third term and if you multiply this term with k uh, the propagation constant then this will give you the phase because k times z is nothing but phase so this k times this quantity it will be nothing but um, it will be nothing but the phase that we have dropped uh, during the approximation because we are representing uh, spherical wavefronts with the parabolic wavefronts so this is the uh, the drop the phase that we have dropped so now i want to see i want to see that what should be uh, what should be the minimum value of phase shift that should be there in order to have very minimum errors uh, in the diffraction integrals okay so let me take new page okay so the phase change because of the approximation will be k times uh, that quantity it will be given by this if you simplify this will be given by this e this expression x minus zeta whole square plus y minus eta whole square and let us take the maximum value and as a convention this maximum phase shift it is generally taken as less than one radian Okay, so that simply means that, okay, so let me write down this statement here. That maximum phase change induced by dropping uh, uh, dropping third term is less than one radian and one radian is typically uh, well let me write one radian is typically 57 degrees approximately 57 degrees so this is a convention so for the frontal approximation to hold good that this condition should be satisfied okay so what should be the value of z okay so let me write down from this equation that z should be greater than pi upon 4 lambda x minus zeta whole square plus y minus eta whole square x so if your distance is greater than this quantity your final approximation what is approximation x minus zeta is uh, very less than z and y minus eta is very less than z this will be holding very good and there will be very minimal error that will be introduced because of this approximation
okay so this should be the distance this this the, the distance of screen uh, should be greater than this value if you want a very minimum error okay okay so now uh, let me write down the deflection integral again the convolution form which is given by u of x y is equal to e raised to power j k upon z divided by j lambda z because I want to write down uh, this integral in another very beautiful form okay so it will be just take one minute very simple mathematics x minus zeta whole square plus y minus eta whole square and the integral is over eta and zeta that is the initial plane zeta eta plane so what you do you just open this term this this will be x square plus zeta square minus 2x zeta y square plus zeta square minus 2y eta since we are integrating upon zeta eta so x square will be constant y square will be constant of course z is constant so e raised to power jk upon 2z x square plus y square that term can be taken outside okay so what you will be left with this you just please do it's very simple this is this term the first term and e raised to power jk upon 2z x square plus y square because x and y can be taken constant because integration is over, up, uh, over zeta and eta and this can be written as u of zeta eta e raised to power jk upon 2z zeta square plus eta square e raised to power minus j k okay there is a minus sign minus j k upon z x eta plus y x zeta plus y eta d zeta d eta so this will be the final form after taking e raised to power uh, j k upon 2z x square plus y square outside the integral because uh, um, this is not going to be effective because we are integrating over zeta and eta so we have taken this constant value um, outside the integral okay so this minus sign is because here you will be getting minus 2x zeta minus 2y eta okay so let me highlight this so if you look carefully this term e raised to power jk upon z x eta plus y eta if you look at this term very carefully you can easily identify that this integral is nothing but the Fourier transform of the product of u zeta eta and the quadratic phase function which is quite uh, which is similar to the Fresnel impulse response function so this also gives you very important result so what is the result the result is that the final field the final field that will be nothing but the Fourier transform of Fresnel impulse response function multiplied by u of zeta eta this is very important result so what does it mean that if you are given an aperture function u zeta eta so if you want to calculate the Fresnel prof Fresnel diffraction on a plane at a distance z so what you do you just multiply um, the u zeta eta the aperture function with the quadratic phase function e raised to power jk upon 2z this z is here z is z will be decided by the distance zeta square plus zeta square so this will be your final field on the screen okay okay so if you assume this z if this z is very very greater than k upon 2 uh, zeta square plus zeta square maximum okay let me write if if z is very large uh, larger if, if, if the value of z is very large as compared to k upon 2 z square plus and zeta square plus zeta square so the value of this function and the value of the power of exponential the, val uh, the value of power of uh, exponential will be very small because this z is I have taken very small as compared to k upon 2 zeta square plus zeta square maximum so that means the value of this Fresnel impulse response function will become unity 
So that means that e raised to power j k upon 2z zeta square plus eta square it will be unity and the diffraction integral becomes simply becomes e raised to power j k z upon j lambda z e raised to power j k upon 2z x square plus y square and you have u of zeta eta e raised to power minus j k upon z x eta plus pi eta d zeta d eta ok so this is another form and the approximation is this one and this approximation is known as Fraunhofer approximation this is Fraunhofer approximation and if you the value of z is much much greater than this term the diffraction pattern on the screen is nothing but the Fourier transform of it's nothing but just the Fourier transform of the aperture function previously the diffraction pattern was nothing but the Fourier transform of product of uh, aperture function with a quadratic phase factor but here there is no quadratic phase factor and this integral is known as Fraunhofer diffraction integral this is Fraunhofer diffraction integral and uh, um, this integral is known as uh, this approximation is known as Fraunhofer approximation and uh, if the distance is greater than this then you will be in the Fraunhofer region Fraunhofer region if distance is very large okay so with this one I will be ending my lecture a very small brief lecture so what I have discussed today I have discussed the Fresnel approximation then I have discussed the Fraunhofer approximation and I have also discussed that what should be the value of z to have uh, minimal error introduced because of Fresnel approximation and what should be the minimum uh, z what should be the minimum value of z what should be the minim minimum value of distance of screen from the aperture so that uh, the error intro introduced is minimal because of Fraunhofer approximation I have also discussed with you the convolution form of diffraction integral okay and I will I have also discussed with you that how you calculate uh, the 